Thank you for clicking on to this reaction. I hope you're looking forward to it just as much as I am. If you haven't already, head over to the content creators page. That link is in the description box down below. If you haven't already and you're enjoying our content, you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, but we're gonna jump straight into this one. Jump straight into this. So for this reaction, we have how did the Mongols conquer strongholds and cities? Let's go. Mongolian success in taking fortified strongpoints across 13th century Eurasia was one of their most extraordinary feats. At the beginning of the 1200s, few of the nomads of the Mongolian steppe had ever seen a building beyond their felt yurts. Yet by the end of the century, they could take the mightiest metropolises of China. Imagine that, only from like 100 years, you not seeing buildings, being able to like absolutely adapt your warfare and then be able to conquer and destroy them. Absolutely crazy. In this third episode of our series on the Mongol army, we'll explore what made the Mongols so adept at siege warfare and where this siege ability met its limit. Thanks to Magellan TV for sponsoring for this video. In the 12th century Mongolian steppe, warfare was between forces of highly mobile horse archers, though a few forts were scattered across the region largely left over from the rule of the Khitan Liao dynasty. With raids on China uncommon in this period, there was little opportunity for up-and-coming warlords like the young Temujin mm -hmm. to learn how to assault fortified sites. With the declaration of the Mongol Empire in 1206 and consolidation of his rule over the region, Temujin, now taking the title of Chinggis Khan, could begin new assaults mm -hmm. on China. His first target was not the immense Jurchin-ruled Jin dynasty, but its vassal, the Tangut Shisha Kingdom. Here, the newly formed Mongol Empire had its first test against cities and forts. They Lacking well, siege they? equipment, the Mongols could rely on only three tactics. The first yeah. was the simplest, a blockade to attempt to starve the city into submission. The second was, siege warfare 101. was the feigned retreat, Appearing to panic before the walls, the Mongols would trick the garrison into running out to pursue them, or collect seemingly abandoned animals, goods and slaves, only for the Mongols to suddenly fall upon them. The final was the most complicated, used first against the Tangut capital, modern-day Yinchuan. A nearby river would be dammed or redirected, forcing the waters towards the city. Chinese walls made of rats. So yeah, I think I've heard about that before, but that is quite a useful tactic, diverting the river. And earth would be undermined. Uh, and I can imagine that takes a lot, a lot of time, more than building a uh, siege warfare, right? And when the water stagnated, it spread disease throughout the city. Uh, the first attempt against the Tangut was not a smashing success, for the Mongols accidentally flooded their own camp in the process. Still, by 1210, Genghis Khan succeeded in taking the submission of the Tangut, mm -hmm. and these three tactics were to be utilized again and again. The next lesson in the sieging of cities came in 1211, when Genghis Khan led his armies against the Jin dynasty. The Jin's border defenses, the predecessor to the more famous Great Wall of the mm. Ming dynasty, ran through modern Inner Mongolia's steppeland, consisting of a long ditch and earthen wall. This was bypassed as the tribes manning them submitted to Chinggis Khan and let him through. Over Easy way to get around it. For their first year of battle against the Jin, the Mongols routinely won in dramatic field battles like Yehuling and devastated the countryside. But cities, towns and forts could only be taken when the garrisons were drawn into feigned retreats. As Mongol victories over the Jin army that's why he struggled at the beginning to take China, isn't it? He's mounted, and the dynasty seemingly looked like it was losing the mandate of heaven. A steady flood of defections of Kitan, Jurchens, and Chinese provided Chinggis Khan the secret to the ancient Chinese arts of taking cities. Well, Some of these the were basic it, tools. Woodworkers constructed simple rams, ladders, and mobile shelters, which could be used to approach the walls. Vast numbers of defected or press-ganged Chinese infantry could climb ladders or push siege equipment. 
more valuable were actual siege specialists and engineers, mm. who provided the specialized tools of taking cities. Large wheeled scaling ladders, including the folding cloud ladder, provided quick means for large groups of men to mount the walls. That would make sense. I, I, yeah, that's really cool. I really like that sort of design there. Um, yeah, I really, I really find that interesting. A large wooden screen held onto a mobile arm provided cover for these scaling ladders from enemy mm. arrows. Some That's of cool. the most effective were the ranged weapons, catapults and oxbows. The Chinese used a traction catapult. Teams of men would pull on ropes attached to one end of the arm of the catapult, thus propelling its projectile through manpower. That's interesting because not everyone used man-powered catapult catapults right they would have used some kind of uh other levy as a weight um so it's interesting that they use manpower over a levy the oxbow was essentially a large crossbow used to pick the defenders off the walls these tools and the experience to build them were adopted by the mongols quickly cities would showing why the mongols were such a um such a, a, a decent Ism Empire is their ability to adapt was just crazy. Now fall to them with regularity, and by 1215, after a protracted and bloody siege, they took the Jin capital of Zhengdu, modern Beijing. When taking a city that had refused to submit to them, such as Zhengdu, another tool was employed: massacres. Mm. The intention was to spread fear absolutely terrify your opponent so massacre the population so that they just give up the um parcel to you so that they don't suffer the same consequences a very very good tactic and very understandable as you whether it's justifiable or not is obviously a completely different uh discussion in general but a simple message cities which immediately surrendered were Rudy, is that the uh, catapults? Uh, they were less effective than the later ones in Euro uh, Europe. ...were treated relatively leniently, generally needing only to send tribute, perhaps mm -hmm. supply soldiers, or tear down their fortifications. Exactly. Cities which tried to resist were severely punished, especially if through their resistance they brought on Mongol losses or killed mm. a Mongol prince. In which case, the destruction was thorough, the slaughter indiscriminate. Individuals of skill, such as artisans, engineers, and craftsmen, were spared, sent elsewhere for service to the Great Khan. Surely that was only if they survived, though. So, like, during the main consequences of the, um, of the fight and the warfare and the first initial moments of the siege and the breaking through the gates and the carnage that happens, it's a free-for-all. If you survive that and you're rounded up and you're able to then explain that you're um, you have these abilities, you would be able to get away for it, uh, away with it, and be able to sort of be put onto somewhere else. But of course, if you just don't have the time to explain that, you've got no chance. So yeah, I don't think every single craftsman, artisman survived. I think it was the only ones after the the first initial, um, after the first initial breakout had calmed down. That they'll be able to do it. Yo, like you good. Check out forging years above. Yeah, I might be able to give it a bit late uh look a bit later on. And the trebuchet. Cheers, Rudy. Let's jump back into it. And the remainder of the citizenry slaughtered. Mm. Slaughter allowed the Mongol troops to exert their pent-up frustration at a long siege. But generally, the Mongols viewed it as a practical necessity. They lacked the numbers to provide garrisons for every city, and didn't want to... Which is fair, because that's a lot of people you would need to garrison every single city. ...engage in lengthy sieges for every settlement. The fear of the consequences that would come from resistance was just as effective a tool as the most powerful catapult. Horrific mm. atrocities, such as building towers of severed heads to intentionally exaggerate the numbers killed in cities, all served to buttress an image of the Mongols as an unstoppable and implacable foe. It's just, it's, it's so interesting to sort of see it 
um, and hear about it because I'd imagine it, it it did really petrify people and it really did make you think is it worth um, fighting against these people because I don't think many people would and it also makes me think of the um, Night Lords from War, uh, Warhammer 40k and how they sort of use bit fear within their sort of tactic. Many cities would simply submit rather than face such an existential threat. The war against the Khwarezmian Empire provided the next greatest evolution of Mongol siege techniques. Muhammad II Khwarezm Shah's defensive strategy against the Mongols consisted of maintaining garrisons across his empire's northeastern frontier, mm -hmm. based on the simple but sadly mistaken calculation that the Mongols lacked the means to take cities. Mm. Chinggis Khan brought with So he was relying on the fact that they didn't adapt. What a mistake, what for? Him teams of Chinese siege engineers to construct his weapons, and by then his army was well versed in the art of the siege. You know. With access to large teams of engineers, Chinggis Khan would array vast groups of catapults to concentrate on a single section of the enemy wall, mm. firing day and night in an incessant barrage, Tremendous. demoralizing the defenders and grounding the fortifications to dust, or bringing pots of naphtha into the city to spread fire and chaos. Mm. Mongol troops, protected by mobile shelters, would advance on the walls, using their excellent archery to pick off any defender foolish enough to stick his head over the crenellations. Say what? Imagine being a, a sharpshooter with a bow. Just being a sniper with a bow, that must take some skill. That must take some absolute skill. Also, once again, the problem here is these people don't understand. They didn't get the, the full warning of the atrocities that the Mongol were willing to do. So that's why they're willing to defend their place, and they're soon going to regret it, aren't they? Gained retreats repeatedly drew overconfident garrisons out to be slaughtered. Mm -hmm. The Khwarezm Shah's decisions to leave each city to its own defense allowed them all to be picked off one by one. Fear and demoralization were refined as tools of conquest, a psychological assault as well as physical. Mm -hmm. Massacres and absolute destruction rewarded cities which held out, like Urgench, mm. or rose up after previously submitting, like Merv and Nishapur. Attacking the rural and lesser settlements around a major city, and driving refugees into the city, brought panic and exaggerated stories of Mongol prowess, and also stressed the city's resources. The flight... Once again, I've explained all that to Jack, like, the... the... the problems for a city when you start ra uh, raiding the outside areas. ...of Khwarezm Shah Muhammad, hounded to his death by Jebe and Subutai, mm. prevented the Khwarezmian leadership from becoming a rallying point to organize a defense. Fake letters were allowed to be intercepted by the Khwarezmians, claiming the Khwarezm Shah's mother was in cooperation with Chinggis Khan, which wrought further disunity. Oh, wow. So they were just even also poisoning the wells with the political aspect and landscape as well. That's quite funny. That's absolute jokes. Another gruesome method was called the Hashar in the Persian sources. This was the forced levy. Captive mm -hmm. townfolk were forced at spear point before the Mongol army, making it appear larger than it was. During a siege, they were forced against the walls, taking the most vulnerable positions as veritable meat shields, soaking up enemy arrows while pushing siege equipment or filling in moats, often with their own bodies. We, uh, we, we've heard that a lot throughout this whole series, what uh, it meant if you was enslaved by the, um, the Mongols and what, what jobs you could possibly have to deal with. The defenders were forced into the mental torment of mm. having to fire on people from neighboring cities or allow them to advance. Imagine that psychological warfare, having to shoot on people that you know uh, or shoot, shoot people that believe in the same beliefs as you. Once the Mongol siege, the more valuable Mongol and Turkic horsemen were thus protected from menial labor and could keep their strength for the actual fighting. When Chinggis Khan returned to the Tangut Kingdom in 1226 for his final campaign, his army was well hardened at siege warfare. The Tangut cities now fell in quick succession, no and when Chinggis died in August 1227, the Tangut capital was raised to join him.
Mm. Mongol siege abilities continued to advance under Chinggis's son and successor, Ogadai. In North China, the Jurchen Jin were finally reduced. The Jin capital of Kaifeng was taken through a difficult year-long siege, in which it seems early gunpowder bombs were used by both sides. Okay. The Jin that's quite interesting. Dropped them onto mobile shelters, protecting sappers attempting to undermine the walls, mm. while the Mongols used catapults to lob them into the city. Some historians. What mole pull at a time? Just like it lobbed like ten at a time. That's quite interesting. How how um, effective were they? That's my question. Most notably, Doctor Stephen Hoare point to the possible use of early cannons during this fighting. But the evidence is controversial and will be examined in the following video. Ooh, nice. I like it when they do a little teaser because I'm interested to find out if they was used in there and where the sources come from. The Mongols do not seem to have used gunpowder weapons outside of fighting in China and Japan. Mongol right. sieges in Korea met with surprising difficulty. Anyone know why that was? At Kuju in late 1231, Multiple assaults on the city were repulsed. One commander with a few picked men drove off repeated attacks by the Mongol vanguard. Attacks wow, really? were launched on the walls day and night. Carts of dry grass and wood were pushed to the gates to burn mm. them, only to be destroyed by Korean catapults. Nice. A shelter built before the walls to protect sappers was destroyed when the Koreans dug holes through their own walls to pour molten iron onto it. Sca molten iron. Nice boys. Nice boys. Defending against the Mongols. Scaling ladders were toppled by Korean pole arms. Bundles of sticks soaked allegedly in human fat, set aflame and hurled into the city, mm. could not be put out with water, but were smothered with mud and earth. One set of catapults was repulsed by Korean counter-artillery. Another, shit. through constant barrage, breached the wall 50 times. I want to find out more about this battle, boys. And 50 times, Here the defenders go. filled the gaps. After a month without headway, the siege was called off. The city mm. deemed to be protected by heaven. A spirited resistance, as the Mongols faced throughout Korea, could hamper even their efforts. Yeah, definitely. In the Rus principalities, the armies of Batu and Subutai were met with much greater success. The wooden walls of the low-lying Rus cities were easy prey for the warriors of the Great Khan. So they didn't need as much uh, siege warfare then. Palisades were erected around the cities to trap the townsfolk, protect the besiegers, and cover their actions. Catapult teams acting in unison made multiple breaches in the walls and spread fire in the cities. Mm. Few held out more than a few weeks. Was it all wooden cities, like, or majority wooden city uh, for the Rus, the, Rus, uh, the Rus city we're talking about? In the eastern half of the Hungarian kingdom, where fortified sites were made of wood in the east. Yeah, I know psychological effects probably only work the first time and it could only work for so long. Easily accessible terrain of the great Hungarian plain, the Mongols were unstoppable. Mm, the population in these areas reached as high as 70% by some estimates. The population in some of the areas by 70%. To ensure the population of a given site was reduced, the Mongols would leave for a few days after taking the city. They, oh, I think I remember hearing this. They would leave, wait people to come back, collect their goods, try and like sort their city out, and then come back and slaughter them. Oh my, oh my god. Could you imagine that you're coming back just to get your stuff, and then you hear the trumpets or the, the horses coming? You that's it. You, you Those who had done. survived would come out from their hiding places in search of food or to begin to repair the damage. With their guard let down, Mongol riders would suddenly return in. and fall upon them, repeating this process until no more came mm. out from hiding. Not just the once, they would just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. That's savage. That is savage. That is, that is taking extermination through to the end. In the more densely populated and rugged western half of Hungary, past the Danube, 
where the major sites were protected by hard-to-access stone fortifications, mm. the Mongols found their progress slowed. At Estegom in early 1242, Hungary's main political center, Hungarian prisoners were forced to build a screen of bundles of twigs before the city's moat to cover 30 siege engines. Okay. Once the catapults had brought down the city's towers and part of the walls, they began to hurl bags of dirt into the moat, the garrison unable to clear it due to the precision of Mongol archers. Mm. With it apparent the city was to be breached, the townsfolk set fire to the suburbs, destroyed or hid anything of value, then retreated to the citadel. A furious Batu, denied his prize, was unable to take the stone citadel. I was unable An to able take defense it. led by Simon the Spaniard, commanding teams of Ballistarius, referring either to crossbowmen or counter siege engines, kept the Mongols from breaching the citadel. Mm. Batu pulled back from Estegom, leaving nothing standing of the city but the citadel. Just literally absolutely decimated that suburb because he couldn't get his prize by absolute selfishness. Further difficulties were had at Sikesh Fahirva. The outer part of the city and its suburbs were razed by the Mongols. But again, the stone citadel, defended by Hospitaller knights and their own counter-artillery, resisted the Mongol assaults. After a few days, the siege was lifted, and soon the Mongols began a slow withdrawal from Europe. For more on the reasons for a Mongol withdrawal from Europe, you can check out episode 19 mm -hmm. of our podcast on the Mongols. But it seems that stone castles, built on hard-to-access sites, proved difficult for the Chinese-style catapults the Mongols used, with their crews reduced by enemy counter-artillery. So they're used to sort of taking out the uh, buildings in uh, Asia and the sort of uh, construction and, um, yeah, the construction that they had over there. But when it come over to the west, um, the points of the castle and the stone, uh, the actual stoned castles themselves, when they started struggling, that's really, really interesting. The withdrawal in 1242 may have begun as a temporary retreat to prepare reinforcements and more catapults, only for political matters relating to the death of Ogadai Khan to keep them from immediately returning. Mm -hmm. When Hulagu set on his campaign against episode. the Nazari assassins and the Caliph in the 1250s, he was met with a variety of well-defended sites. Mm -hmm. The Nazari strongholds were cunningly designed, nearly impregnable mountain fortresses. Most fell through negotiated surrender thanks to the capture of the Nazari Imam. But once again, it wasn't necessarily, um, it was the fact that they were in the, the mountains and they were so difficult to the siege. But it's not just, uh, it was the positioning of, of the castles that made it very difficult for them to sort of conquer. Some resisted, and were so strong they only fell after lengthy blockades. Mm. Namasar, near Alamut, fell after a year, and Gurdka... But once again, after blockades, so they had to starve them out, they didn't necessarily actually break into them. They just demoralized the men so much that they gave up. ...on the eastern edge of the Elbers Mountains, withstood a Mongol siege for 15 years. Mm. Unable to bring their large teams of catapults to bear upon them, such sites could hold out as long as their food stores did. Yeah, like I said, so the siege weapons, because of the positions, they weren't able to make the siege weapons, uh, or at least get the siege weapons stable enough to sort of use them. For more accessible locales like Baghdad, built in the Great Mesopotamian floodplain, there was little chance for the isolated and outnumbered defenders. Mm. There, huge teams of catapults could work in unison unceasingly against designated sections of the walls. After only a few days of this, the walls of Baghdad were breached and the Mongols were in the city. And what a shame that was that they got into ba uh, Baghdad. At the start of 1260, Hulagu, assisted by troops from Georgia, Armenian Cilicia, the Principality of Antioch and County of Tripoli, took Aleppo despite its well-maintained and sturdy fortifications, sending shockwaves through the Ayyubid princes of Syria. Mm. It's quite possible that this close cooperation with the Crusader kingdoms brought the next evolution to Mongol siege technology Ooh, in the okay. form of the counterweight trebuchet. Here we go. Able to launch projectiles. And this is what I was talking about earlier with the counterweight. 
Um, I think I said levy, but I, I meant a counterweight. Tiles further and harder than a traction catapult, the trebuchet used weight and gravity to replace teams of men pulling on ropes. Mm -hmm. Having spread across Europe and carried to the region by the Crusader kingdoms, the Mongols carried it even further. I see. For the siege of Shenyang, Kublai Khan requested Hulagu's son and successor, Abaka, to provide him with Arab engineers capable of building these fearsome weapons. Once again, he's a, uh, the Mongols' ability to adapt, uh, see technology and go, we need to use that. So, so good. Thus did engineers make the long trek across Mongol-dominated Eurasia to bring the trebuchet to the Great Khan in China. Xiangyang and its sister city of Fancheng were defended by huge walls and moats so wide the traction catapults were powerless against them. Mm. Possibly, as identified by Stephen Hoare, the defending Song dynasty forces used some sort of cannon mounted on small boats to break the Mongol blockade and allow the cities to be continually resupplied by river. Okay. I, th I think I I've... I've heard about, well, I've, I've sort of looked into this sort of error a little bit, um, not massively, but I was sort of interested in Marco Polo at one point in time, and I do believe it was around this time he was around and, and there was some information. I remember bits and pieces, but I'm really interested that they had the boats um, which were going along the river, which stopped the Mongols from invading, which allowed them uh, the... Song Dynasty to get resupplied. That's really, really interesting. That's not something that I'd uh, sort of come across before. So once again, uh, kings and general, kings and generals, dropping a bit of knowledge on me. Dynasty forces used some sort of cannon mounted on small boats to break the Mongol blockade mm. and allow the cities to be continually resupplied by river. Nice. The siege dragged on for five years until the arrival of these trebuchets. Indeed. greatly outranging the defensive weapons mm. within the cities. They could be set back further enough for the cannons not to be able to uh, interrupt. They them. broke both the walls and the spirit of the defenders. Mm. Having once picked up their first siege weapons in China, Ooh. the Mongols returned with the most advanced weapons of the age. Yet the fall of Shangyang and the Song dynasty by the end of the decade also became the high-water mark of successful Mongol conquests. Successful sieges in their ensuing campaigns did not translate into strategic success, mm. and in wars against the Mamluks and Delhi Sultanate, hot weather, strong fortresses, and able defense stood defiant against Mongol efforts. Also, with the Mamluks, they were they they learned not to keep um, their forces separated and to unite their forces into one area. Um, and once again, showing the ability to adapt. Uh, and defend against the Mongols. As catapults and other complicated siege machines became a smaller part of the armies after the mm. end of the unified Mongol Empire, and they had less access to the vast reserves of manpower to send as fodder and to man See, large numbers of catapults, the successor Khanates could not repeat the many victories in siege warfare their grandfathers had enjoyed. Okay, so that actually makes a lot of sense. The lack, uh, the lack of uh, people to operate the weaponry and then also the lack of people to be able to tap into of their knowledge to make the weaponry um, obviously means that they were at a, a disadvantage compared to the actual United Mongol Empire. Lacking in both political will and unity, they could not develop means to overcome their gradual deficiencies in siege warfare, mm -hmm. though the heirs of Chinggis Khan remained yet deadly in open battle. That they did. We can see that by tomorrow. Our videos on the Mongol armies will continue, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. And you know I have, and what a great reaction as always by kings and generals.